Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. This is my chance to give you an overview of the case. It's a case about organized crime, public corruption, and all sorts of illegal activities ranging from extortion to drug dealing to money laundering to possession of machine guns to murder, 19 murders. It's about a criminal enterprise, which is a group of criminals who ran amok in the city of Boston for almost 30 years. So you hear about crimes in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. And at the center of all this murder and mayhem is one man, the defendant in this case, James Bulger. You will hear that eventually, while he started out as just one of the many members of this enterprise. Eventually he took control. He became the leader. He was no ordinary leader. He did the dirty work himself because he was a hands-on killer. Let's go back to the summer of 1983. There was a man named Arthur Barrett. Everyone called him Bucky. Bucky Barrett, by all accounts, a likable guy. Wife, two little kids, owned a restaurant, and he had a fondness for stolen jewelry that he could resell for a profit. And it's this fondness for jewelry that proved to be his undoing. Because in the summer of 83, he was tricked into going to a small home in South Boston at 799 East 3rd Street. He was tricked with the false promise that there would be stolen jewelry there that he could assess and then resell for a profit. But instead, when he got to that small home, he didn't see any stolen jewelry. What he saw was this man over here, James Bolger, sticking a gun at him, yelling at him to freeze. And Bucky Barrett froze. And then Bucky Barrett was taken to a chair, handcuffed and chained to that chair. And then for several hours, he was questioned. Questioned by this man over here, James Bolger and his criminal sidekick, Stephen Fleming and they questioned him about other criminals in the area, pumped him for information about their criminal competitors. One of the guys they asked him about was a big dope dealer over in Charleston, Joe Murray. But they asked him a lot of questions. They wanted information that they could use later on to their own benefit. But eventually they got around to asking him where he kept his money. He admitted that he had cash in his house. So they made him call his wife several times to try to get her to leave the house with the young kids so they could go over and take the money. Finally, she was able to do that. She didn't know why she had to leave the house. She just kept getting calls from her husband, Bucky. When she left the house, Bulger and Flemmy went to the house and helped themselves to over $40,000. Now, as you will hear from Elaine Barrett herself, she's a witness in this case. She will tell you that that was the last time she heard from Bucky Barrett. Because Bucky Barrett, while Bulger and Flemmy were at his house stealing money, was back at the small house in South Boston, still chained to the chair, being watched by two other members of his criminal enterprise, one of whom was a guy named Kevin Weeks. Kevin Weeks watched him as he said his prayers. Bolger and Flemmy got back to the house and they continued to question him. They also sent Weeks to his restaurant to pick up another $10,000 that was owed to him. Weeks went and got the $10,000, brought it back to the house where Barrett was still chained to the chair. So all told, they had over $50,000 and this was money that was never going back to Barrett. Eventually, Bulger led Barrett to the top of the cellar stairs, and they made a little joke to Kevin Weeks. They said Barrett's going downstairs to lie down for a while. As Barrett walked down the stairs, this man over here, James Bulger, shot him in the back of the head, killing him. This little house at 799 East 3rd Street didn't have a regular cement cellar. It was dirt. It was the dirt cellar where Bucky Barrett was buried. Bulger didn't get involved in the burial process. He let his other gang members do that. He stayed upstairs and rested on the couch. Now that's not the last murder that Bulger himself committed in that home in South Boston. But it is crimes like these, vicious crimes, that made Bulger and his gang widely feared. And that's how they made a lot of money, because this enterprise, whether it's legal or illegal enterprises, always wants to make money. And that's what this illegal enterprise was in the business of doing. And they made millions of dollars extorting people. And part of their success was due to their fearsome reputation that is, other criminals were afraid of them. Other criminals would rather pay them off than argue with them or fight with them. And that's what's known as extortion, when people are forced to pay money because of threats or fear of harm. And this defendant, Mr. Bulger, extorted all sorts of people. He extorted bookmakers. In fact, one of the first witnesses you will hear from in this trial was a bookmaker named Dick O'Brien. He was a bookmaker who was forced to make extortion payments or rent as all the bookies called it, to Bulger and his gang. And why? 
Because bookmakers are guys who make a living taking sports bets for people. So if you want to bet on the Patriots or the Bruins, whatever, you call a bookie or a bookmaker. And it's a crime. Obviously not the most serious crime, but a crime nonetheless. And it's actually very profitable. But the bookies who do it are very easy prey to the more violent criminals in the community. Because the bookies who do it, if they're approached and told they have to pay rent, don't want to run to the police, then they have to admit in their own wrongdoing, engage in gambling. But also, they don't want to run to the police because they're afraid of Bulger and his gang. So they all paid rent, or tribute, or extortion, because they really had no other choice. They couldn't refuse to pay and stay in business. Because if they refused to pay and still stayed in business, they got hurt. And that's what they had to pay for, permission to operate. You'll hear it wasn't just the bookies. It was also drug dealers in the area. They, too, were afraid of Bulger and his gang, so they, too, had to pay. Sometimes they paid on a frequent basis, so-called rent. Sometimes they were fined and had to pay a lump sum. Now, you will hear from several drug dealers who dealt directly with Bulger. You will hear that Bulger liked to promote the myth that he had nothing to do with drugs. But you will hear from these drug dealers that in the 1980s, Bulger was deeply involved in the distribution of drugs in the South Boston area, especially cocaine. And he and his gang made millions at it. Now, before I go too far with all the facts in this case, let me give you a brief idea of the charges. Because there's going to be a lot of names and places mentioned in this trial, and we will try to be respectful of your time. We'll try to be efficient. And we'll try to present this case in a chronological fashion. It's like putting a puzzle together piece by piece, but sometimes things have to be taken out of order. So let me give you an idea of the charges in this case. 